Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, the Quiet Warrior. All right, everybody, welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show. I'm your host, Tom Dutta, and I'm ever excited today. When was the last time I showed you a book that was titled One-Legged Mongoose? I'm just going to hold this up for those who are going to watch the video production. There it is. And we have the author on today, but he's more than just an author. Let me tell you a little bit about Mark Strauss before we bring him out of the green room. Mark is a poet, a writer, medical oncologist, art collector, and he lives with his wife, Livia, in Chappaqua, New York. He's an author also of numerous scientific papers and articles on contemporary art, and he's published four poetry collections, including Not Good, which was staged on Broadway. That's awesome. His poems and stories have appeared in Plowshares, Kenyan Review, and many other literary journals. And the Strauss founded Hudson Valley MOCA in Peekskill, New York. And I'm excited about Mark running a gallery in New York. Uh, and uh, if you ever get out to New York, you got to drop in and check it out. Everybody, we are live streaming today across LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. This will be produced into an international podcast and a video premiere. Uh, give us a like, uh, subscribe on the YouTube channel, and that allows us to get the release out to you and do more of these shows. So everybody, I'm going to bring on now from the green room, Mr. Mark Strauss. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's kind of fun to have you on from New York, and I'm on the west coast of Canada here. Truly an international interview. Hey, yeah. so Mark, when your book crossed my desk, I was all excited. I've read your book, and I've got a little surprise for you later on uh, on that. Uh, but I wanted to ask a question right off the bat is, you know, why did you write this book? I've been uh, circling writing this book for over 30 years, and... I had to, uh, I couldn't begin it as I had promised my kid brother until my mom passed away. So I began the book and uh, it's a long time coming. <laughs> Hold it up there, Mark. Let's take a full look at that. And just uh, just tell us the title again. One-Legged Mongoose. <laughs> okay. And that in itself, sir, is, uh, the, is the other thing that caught my attention. Uh, I love it. And the fact that you're a poet and you named it this, but I was reading somewhere in, in some information you sent me about the title of the book. Tell us about the title of the book. I know it has special meaning. Yeah, this is a memoir of the years I was 10 to 12 uh, in Long Island. And it's narrated by the kid I was then. And... Um, one-Legged Mongoose is the title of a chapter that occurs later in the book. And we find out as we open, uh, forced to transfer to a religious school in the beginning of fifth grade, which means commuting four hours a day with my kid brother. And we're off to Queens, New York, and uh, the book takes you through the first year. And then we're almost at winter, my second year in the school, and my mom tells me, I've signed you up for the Boy Scouts, <laughs> which I couldn't understand. And in order to get a first badge, you have to go on a weekend camping trip. So off we go in the freezing cold out on Long Island, and we arrive at this um, campsite, and after the campfire, the scout troop leader tells all the kids, well, boys, we're really lucky that we're able to come here this year because the park has been closed to visitors for years because a one-legged mongoose, half man, half mongoose, has roamed the park for years and killed people. But nobody's seen it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so almost all I, the boys <laughs> eating their pants. <laughs> I'm shaking in my boots. First of all, you know, this uh, show is about the hero's journey, telling stories, trading stories. And I was a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. My dad was a military commanding officer, Mark. So I totally remember times being out in the bush. I think one of the stories I remember is we were told to go out and create a plaster cast of a footprint. And then we were scared 
you know, what list <laughs> as we went to sleep the first night, wondering what all these big footprints were from. Uh, it's a pretty cool story, everybody, the the mongoose. And uh, going back, first of all, I want to honor you about what you said up front here. It's uh, I think it's a strength in leadership, Mark, to be vulnerable or to open yourself up to perhaps uh, sensitivity. So saying you waited till your, your uh, mom passed to write this uh, book, I just want to read something out of here for everybody, and then we'll get you to talk a little bit about it. Uh, so we, we, we know this is a memoir, everyone, it, written in the 1950s New York. And there's a part in here talks about your, your upbringing. I just want to read this paragraph. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It was, it was fists that Strauss was used to after years of fighting off bigger kids who harassed his younger, sensitive, bullying magnet brother, Stephen. It was fists that he was used to at home where in addition to Stephen, he lived with a secondhand dog named Twinkie, his older sister, Miriam, who af afraid there's a bogeyman in the basement and who only reads books with love and nice endings. His hardworking chess playing Polish immigrant father whose textile store he worked at every Sunday and his red haired chain smoking gifted pianist mother who beat him repeatedly, relentlessly, uh, starting when he was two years old for such offenses as breaking a vacuum clean bag. Tell us, I mean, I got to ask you this because I come from, if you get to know my backstory, uh, a violent childhood. My father was a drinker and a commanding officer. So it was a combination that wasn't great. Uh, somebody told me once that our parents just, you know, parented us the best they could with what they had. Uh, tell us about that experience growing up with that and it at the young age, we don't really know, right, why those things are happening. We don't understand it until later years in life. I think um, my mom was a brilliant woman who was ne never able to fulfill her promise. She could have been a world-class pianist and gave it up. She had to leave high school during the Depression. Yeah. Uh, but e even so, something was obviously wrong with her because from before the age of two, uh, she would suddenly go off and beat me mercilessly. And I protected my kid brother, Stephen, uh, who was never beaten. And my older sister, Miriam, wasn't beaten. So I endured this uh, and we see this and I'm trying to figure out how to extricate myself as the book ends. Yeah, there's a and there's a thread in that story, Mark. Again, we honor you and love the fact that you're sharing this. There's there's a thread in society that this story seems to repeat itself over and over again. And I remember at the age of twelve when I sort of became homeless, my parents divorced, and you know that was the end of my family. I just remember that you didn't talk about things, and there was a, a bit of a stigma around you know violence or abuse in the home. Uh, did you ever learn about your mother's? parenting or what her her growing up was when she was a child? Um, not a lot. I was close with uh, her father, uh, Grandpa Max, who died when I was very young. Then I was close with her mother. Uh, my mother was one of five kids. She had four large brothers, most of whom fought in World War II. And I once asked one of my uncles, uh, did Grandma Katie beat you? And he said, well, it wasn't too bad, just pots and pans. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought he was laughing. It couldn't be that bad. But I think there's a likelihood uh, my mother was mentally ill, that she was bipolar. Yeah, these are these are very uh, very important facts, uh, even if we can't prove them uh, post death. But uh, again, riffing on that point, my father was a uh, military commanding officer. But before my dad passed away in January 2018, Mark, after being estranged from him most of my life, I had coffee with him. I think God called me to go and and see Dad, and I was actually seeking forgiveness because I suffered through my life with this uh, story. And I remember in that coffee, my dad saying, I love you, son. I'm sorry um, uh, about the things I did. And then I asked dad, I said, tell me about grandfather. Because my grandfather passed away and I never knew him. But that's when I learned, Mark, that I was looking. My dad 
I could have been what my dad became if I had taken the path he did, but his childhood was just like, like mine. His dad, my grandfather was a chronic alcoholic, uh, and dad's life was tough and violent. And so at a young age, I guess he, maybe some of that behavior and maybe some of the, uh, uh, the genetic factor transferred over. And it was at that moment that I was able to let that fall away, that, that feeling and that pain. And today I can say, honestly, as I, so admire you said i love my dad and i always search for the meanings in his story what are the strengths that he left with me so i really like how you wrote this book uh to tell the story but also to honor some of the strengths take us into a piece of this mark there's a there's a you were sent to school four hours away and then uh, uh there's some thread in here about anti-semitism what was that all about my dad was an impoverished immigrant who yeah. came to New York at age 15, uneducated, went to work full time. When I was in my, he was in his 20s, he opened a textile store in New York. And I had the good luck to start working there from the age of five. But like a lot of people, immigrants entering the middle class, he thought, well, you go out and buy a house now. And he bought a little house out in Long Island and then went to work. And he didn't know that the neighborhood was rabidly anti-Semitic. There were almost no Jews. Um, you know, the, I learned even as a little kid, it doesn't come from the kids. This is something they hear in their house. A kid doesn't start off being racist. And it was tough but it was tougher for my younger brother. And he just attracted bullies. And I had a way of finding out if anybody hit him. And then I would, I would go out and beat them up. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I, spent, I, I spent my childhood beating up a lot of kids. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not laughing at you. I'm actually having this, I have this multidimensional brain. I think that visualizes things. I'm trying to picture you because you're such a calm, nice, nice guy <laughs> being one of those guys who's beating the crap out of people in a schoolyard. I, I'm an advocate, by the way, Mark, for uh, the, the whole thing of anti-bullying. Uh, I was picked on as a kid growing up <clears throat> for many reasons, color of my skin. And maybe I projected a bit also being a little heavy set, but uh uh, a friend of mine wrote a book a few years ago, and I gave my my name and a passage uh, endorsement on it. And I think I said something like, uh, "Standing up for somebody else is the first step of learning how to stand up for yourself." And uh, and so good for you and putting yourself out there to to. When, to when I there's there's a story in the book. Yeah. Um, and the second summer, I contracted polio, and I was totally bedridden for two months. And, you know, fortunately I had no aftermath, but as I was starting to recover, my family sent me off to camp with two weeks to go. And I was really weak. And I entered this bunk where I'd never been there, where all the kids know each other. And the first night I see it, there's a kid in the bunk uh, bullying another kid and it was relentless. And the kid being bullied was crying. And I watched the other kids in the bunk, some of them join in. And the person I disliked the most was a kid in the corner pretending he was reading a book and not seeing it. Wow. And, and I remember going over to him and saying, you're just as bad. You're just as bad pretending this isn't happening. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, everyone. We're talking to Mark Strauss, the author of One-Legged Mongoose. Mark, hold up that book again. Let's take a look at it. It's an amazing cover. Whoop, here we are. Perfect. Now, just a little bit on the book. Uh, there's a bunch of people on there. What was the thought behind that cover? Now, I know this was 1950s New York, right? Well, it was. This is The editor did something really unusual, and at first I couldn't see how we would pull it off, but then I loved it. He brings in my he brings in my dad's store that he opened in 1943 Strauss Gold and Lori Side was a textile oh, store. Amazing. But there, 
are people from that time in the lower middle. I'm on my dad's sh shoulder. I'm a little kid. But there's, um, there's Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah. Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, Roy Rogers, and Tonto. And um, these are all characters from that time. I thought it was great. Yeah, it's it, it. That's really what caught my attention. The, the just brilliant. Everybody, the the book, uh, One Legged Mongoose. There's a passage on the front. It says, "An astonishing memoir, full of humor, heart, vision." I must read, and that's by Mary Kay. And then on the back, there's a lot more. I just wanted to prove I've got the book. Here it is. I've read the whole book, and it's a it's a bit of a a, a read, a few extra pages, but it's a it's just brilliant. I think one of the things I loved about it, Mark, is if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell's concept, the hero's journey, uh, I was able to be, as an average person, put into your story. It just felt like being there. I've never been to 1950s New York. That was a bit before my time. Uh, going back to what you said about polio, I'm just curious in the 50s, you know, me, you're a med medical person, the things have changed, but what was it like back then navigating through polio with no real advanced uh, medicine? Well, everybody was frightened, and the peak of polio was in the summers, and families who could would go off to the country, and the wife and kids would stay there, the father would go to work, maybe come back weekends. But as a kid, I saw a girl, a neighbor, taken out of her house in an iron lung, and she died later. Um, I discovered I had it one summer day. I was trying to walk down the steps from the upper level and my feet wouldn't hold me. And over the next few days, they made the diagnosis, but there wasn't a specific test. It was a diagnosis by exclusion and there was no treatment. And um, about a year and a half after I had polio, uh, the salt vaccine came out. And it's important to remember that in the beginning when it came out, a couple hundred people died and they had to take it off and bring it back. Uh, everyone took it. And we think today about this epidemic with so many people refusing to take a vaccine that is so safe compared to the polio vaccine where everybody took it. Oh, this is a teaching moment, everybody. I just want to highlight this, come back and listen to it. I've, I'm glad you said it that way, Mark. Uh, there's a passage in the book I read when you actually took that shot and everybody in the book that Mark's written, One-Legged Mongoose, he explains as a young man where they gave you a, a large, uh, it was a syringe full of a lot of fluid and uh, I think they put it in your butt twice. And I remember, you can tell us, get us back into that moment, but there was something about it. I just I just cringed. I mean, it was like are you, the amount of pain. I, just tell us a bit well, about that. I, I was in the... Uh, neurologist's office and there was no real treatment so he said you know for a lot of money we I could get a shot of gamma globulin which ostensibly we know today might have had some antibodies and he said we have to do a test dose to make sure you don't have an anaphylactic reaction and a teeny test dose was like somebody put a hot poker right into my butt goodness and I was thinking Oh my God! This is only a test dose. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, first of all, I get to honor you again. I mean, you talk about heroic stories, but there's something I'm always curious about, especially with people who have adversity. But you know, there's two types of people. There's the kind who go down the path of drugs and alcohol and just get lost in themselves. Maybe some of them just take themselves out. And then there's the others who have resilience. And so I'm just going back, paraphrasing some of the parts of this story, Mark. You, growing up, you first of all, you see, you, you defended your brother, Stephen, uh, because he was being bullied, yet you were being, uh, to quote your words, beaten uh, relentlessly uh, by your mom. And then, you know, here you are with polio and you're sucking it up and taking the the, 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 the drills. What do you, where do you get that? What do you, I mean, we're born with characteristics in our personalities, but what, what gave you that resilience? Was it really maybe the, the beatings and the things that you had encountered as a kid that gave you this? What was your chip on your shoulder, I guess, that kept you moving forward? Uh, 
I, I think I compartmentalized getting beaten is part of the way I got through. Um, when it was about to happen, I was able to go into another space in my head and disappear in that space and never feel it. You know, I never felt the physical beating. I always thought if I was in the fist fight, uh, I had an enormous advantage. I wouldn't feel any pain. And I think people compartmentalize trauma in different ways. We think we put it aside, but I have a belief uh, it's there. We, we, we keep it. We retain it somehow. Yeah. And one of the saving graces for me is uh, during the day, I was free to do anything I wanted any time, and I'd be off towns away. Uh, I would go wherever I want, which was usually a long distance. Um, I was a very independent kid. But in this area of my life, even through adulthood, I never told anybody. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, many threads that connect. And I know there's many people watching this broadcast or who will watch it when it's released again that will say that thread or that part of the story is my story. And I think that's why it's such a good thing you've written this book, Mark, because everybody we've been talking now for a good 20 minutes, there, you know, there's many threads in here. There's mental illness, there's uh, childhood abuse, there's, uh, you know, bo anti-bullying. And for a man to stand up uh, an accomplishment like Mark and share those stories, I mean, there's a deep meaning behind it. You mentioned about your mom, possibly bipolar. I think my dad, Mark, had uh, from his childhood probably dealt with uh, anxiety and and uh, uh, mental illness. Unfortunately, uh, alcohol is a self you know self medicating tool, and I don't think my dad even in AA. And it's one of the questions I have about the whole AA program. Uh, there were, there was never a focus to help my dad with his mental health. And growing up with him, I saw that uh, stress and pressure. I'm also an advocate for uh, mental illness. Uh, in my TED talk a few years ago, I slipped in a bathtub a few years ago, Mark, and had a brain injury, and I slipped into depression. And my first experience with with uh, suicidal thoughts, I shared that live the first time through a TED talk. It scared the heck out of me. And even today, I still see a psychiatrist, and I'm working through anxiety and depression. But I got to say, man, when you write a book and you you talk about things like that, the, the whole men mental health side is huge. Uh, you, New York's been through a lot with uh, obviously like the world with COVID-19 and so many events that have happened uh, out of your control. How's how's New York doing today with uh, things? Uh, much better. It's finally on the downturn, but um, the world dodged a half a bullet. I mean, this is still COVID and people are still dying. Yeah. But this particular variant is less lethal and um, I you know I think there's a lesson there I wish everybody learned it that we need to be vaccinated that's just my strong opinion yeah I share your opinion and in the, in our country I think we have almost 90 percent of people are vaccinated I have double now and I'm waiting for this the booster program we have oh, and just sneak in and get it <laughs> yeah, I think I will. <laughs> and uh, so I just want to, first of all, honor you for saying that. And to everybody watching this, whether you're American, Canadian, or any other culture, get, get get your vaccine. I mean, come on. You just heard Mark talk about the polio experience he had. Uh, it, it's We're trailblazers, and somebody has to. They say the first one through the wall gets bloody. Well, somebody has to be part of that tribe that you know proves that the vaccine works. Uh, I just want to share this with you, Mark, that my daughter, who's uh, 24 years old. She's across the country in a part of our Canada called New Brunswick in university. And she came home for a month. I hadn't seen her for two years because of COVID. She just left. But she brought these uh, self-test kits and N95 masks. And I think, you know, I was proud of her because as a 24-year-old, but uh, the attention and the care, you know, to making sure she didn't affect other people. I think that's the big part that I see in you is you care about other people. I want to take a right turn here in the story because there's a lot more to you with your background. Uh, oncologist, uh, I think you're former chair of oncology and a professor of medicine. You've written, as I read here, 
uh, multiple uh, papers and whatnot. And when you were telling me about escaping your childhood, it, I kind of started connecting dots. Tell me what you think. In my childhood, Mark, I, I escaped cooking. I was baking cookies in the kitchen. And I think today I'm a home chef. I've watched every cooking show and I create my Instagram page has all my creations. But I think we all escape through something to compartmentalize that trauma. And one thing I learned through my mental health, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy just recently is I didn't know what unresolved trauma was, but it's like, okay, if my, if my mother beat me when I was 10, then I could be sitting here today and feel sad or down or depressed about it, yet she's not beating me. And that's really the way I describe unresolved trauma. It, it's always there. It always comes back and we have to practice the self-care. I started thinking about what put you into medicine like this? And then you took a turn into poetry and writing. And I'm thinking like that was maybe part of your drug, you know, of escapism. You had this creativity where you could go on a journey in your head. Uh, and like you said, maybe not think about it. Tell us more about that. You just said it better than I could. Um, when I went to college, I didn't think I would be pre-med. When I was a little kid in the store, I knew for an immigrant like my dad, the best thing his kids could do is become a physician. But I kind of separated from it. And then I applied to medical school early, and it was one of these silly things, thinking, well, if they take me, I'll deal with it. And they took me, and then I went. And I actually didn't like it for the first three years because it was mostly memorization. But then when I began to be involved with sick patients and try to make a difference, I started falling in love with the profession. And um, out of medical school, I spent two years at the National Cancer Institute. I was really lucky to get that position in drug research and development. And cancer medicine was very, very primitive back then. Uh, and I just began to realize there's so much I could do. And I was relentless in the same way. I, I don't know if anybody could have worked harder, but the honor of taking care of a patient who's very sick and being responsible to help make them better, give them uh, quality life, longevity, cure, uh, that's what I spent 40 years doing, and uh, I'm really lucky I was able to do that. But then, in my mid-40s, uh, I just had this notion one day, I want to write poetry. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I wish I could tell you I understood anything more about it, but I luckily got into a great class, and I just started writing, not thinking it was not about whether anybody would read it or care, but the work got accepted very, very quickly. And then going on the road as a poet was an enormous treat. And it was exactly as you describe it. It was speaking from the unconscious. And I think it uh, it gave me greater longevity as a cancer doctor. I mean, I had a voice, and a lot of my poems were about cancer patients. Yeah, I was. everybody, uh, Mark, hold the book up one more time there. We're talking to Mark Strauss, the author of One-Legged Mongoose. Thanks, Mark. We're going to talk to you about that book in a minute from a review perspective. Everybody, an author's work only gets known when you read their book, but you go one step further and post a review on Amazon or goodreads.com or both. So I went, I'm going to recommend, I've got the book here, you get it, and don't just get it, read it and post a review for Mark. It's interesting about the poetry thing. You said you went to take a class because I've always wondered about poetry. I used to write a bit in school, but I read at the back of this book, uh, everyone, there's a series of poems that you put and uh, they're really good and uh, I went to YouTube and started googling or YouTubing Mark and I found a I think I told you this in the show art I set up for you there's a there's a real vintage clip there of you standing up and there's flashes going off and you're reading uh, from a from a book tell us about just an experience reading poetry it's one thing to write it but to share it well I 
I didn't anticipate what was going to happen when my first book came out in 1994 from Triquarterly Northwestern. I was invited to a reading. There were hundreds of people there. And um, my wife claims I was really nervous. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, I had already given over 500 cancer lectures, and I thought, wow, this is a breeze. <laughs> when you're reading poems that come out of your unconscious, it's scary. And wow. you, you're just so vulnerable. And the poems were in the voice of patients, internal monologues, but it was in the voice of an oncologist. And uh, it was as if I was channeling them. And it's, it's, it's such a different feeling reading that kind of work. This book came out of my poetry space. Uh, I let the kid talk. And I would <laughs> be in that place. And suddenly I was there and I could see everything and remember everything. And I just stepped back and the kid told the story. Well, that's amazing. That's the one thing about writing a memoir, Mark. Some people say that to me when I meet them, that, that they've wanted to or been thinking about doing this book all their life and courage or just fear of what people might think or just just not knowing how to do it, get in the way. So. I want to congratulate you for doing that. So speaking of the book, we're going to have some fun and I'm going to share with you. We're going to reveal a international Canadian review of your book. I posted this and so I'm going to put it on the screen and let's just, let's just enjoy. This will be in the show production and I'll send you a copy. There it is. Your first five star or maybe more than that on Canada's uh, Amazon.ca. <laughs> And I titled it, review title, One-Legged Mongoose, this book has legs. <laughs> so, a little bit of my humor in there. And I'm just going to show you proof. There it is, uh, posted on Amazon. Uh, that was January the 14th. I, I love that book. Thank you. Thank so con you. Well, congratulations. And we're just going to you know, have to show some fireworks, get all excited there. There it is, everybody. Five-star review for... Uh, Mark Strauss's book. Now we put in the production so that when you receive this, you can use it as a tool to keep getting the word out there about your book. As we move to the latter part of the interview, Mark, I just want to talk to you about uh, about the whole thing about your art gallery. I'm, I have a personal interest in this. I think channeling your your past adversity into something creative. I believe that serving others and creativity is a very strong way to keep mentally strong. Uh, tell us about the art gallery, and I think it's uh, you've got representing 50 artists or something from 26 countries. Uh, why did you start that, and how, and what, what exactly is it? When uh, the little kid, the not so little, the kid in this book, I was a really good collector. I mean, I was an extraordinarily good baseball card collector. I was this little kid who would go to high schools and wait for some big high school kid to have a card that I wanted, and then I'd win. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was a collector, and by the time I was a teen, I was collecting art. And when I started medical school, I got a weekend job to buy art. You know, if I could squirrel $1,000, I'd go buy a painting nobody wanted. Yeah. I mean, right <laughs> behind me is well, let's full screen you here. A, a crazy red and yellow painting. Oh, yeah. And I... I didn't realize that's a painting, by the way. That's a painting. Well, right. nobody else thought it was a painting back then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly thought it was part of the architecture, but I didn't want to ask. <laughs> well, it's a canvas, red and yellow. Is it really? Uh, yeah. yeah. And... It's a 1970 painting by an American, Ellsworth Kelly. Hmm. And when I bought it, nobody wanted his work. And I thought this is so inventive and different. And I really studied it. And it turned out no one else bought one for seven years. Wow. But he, be he became one of the most famous abstract painters in the world. And seven years ago, the Museum of Modern Art gave him a 90th birthday show with this painting. But Amazing. I was willing 
and my wife was very much a part of it, I was willing to go out there without taking advice and try to figure out my way in. And I, I had to respond to things that I loved, yeah. but I worked hard at it. And I kept collecting. And then when I really thought I needed to stop practicing cancer medicine full time, uh, suddenly one day I said to my wife, I'm going to open an art gallery. And she said, well, what about now we're going to travel a little bit? <laughs> 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 anyway, I opened the gallery right across the street from my dad's store that I worked oh at as a kid, and I love it. And I represent different artists from around the world, and it's my way to support artists whose work I think is important, who need support. That is amazing, and it's so cool, the story of how you, you opened the gallery across from your dad's store. Is the store still there, or I assume it's... No, I mean, he retired in 1980, and it's yeah. a coffee shop downstairs and a karate school upstairs. <laughs> but in your, in your vivid imagination, when you look at it, it's still the store, I'm sure. That's, uh, I remember pretty... all of it. What's the name of the gallery again, Mark? Mark Strauss. Everybody, you'll see the stock ticker on the screen markjstrauss.com and if you're in New York drop into the, the art gallery and check it out uh, amazing stuff I've also gone to that website and there's some really good images of Mark's art there so just a total package one observation Mark when you watch this back uh, I study human behavior and my personality is very emotion based uh, my wife says you can't shut up sometimes it's that uh, uh, you see the uptick in your face your smile your emotion when you're talking about creativity and art uh, so god bless you man that's just awesome your gift to the Thank world you. uh so i want to go to really as we go to wrap up here i want to honor you with a few words mark i don't script these these are words that i write down as i'm interviewing you i call them leadership words the first one is trailblazer uh just to the stepping into from where you were into medicine to opening an art gallery uh, expressing yourself with poetry number two is hero heroic people step into the unknown and come back as a guide or shaman and teach the world you're doing it. Three is Maven. If I think about people I want to talk to about a certain topic, uh, when I think about art now, uh, you're, or poetry, you're in, you're in my mind. And the last one, I think I'll give you two here, kindness and love. There's this compassionate way about you. I just want to be with you and talk to you. And I think that has served you well. So we're going to give you an award now. I'm going to full screen me for a minute. Uh, don't think I told you this. All right. Well, there is an image behind me there, uh, Mark, and it's a challenge coin. The challenge coins were established in World War II. Uh, soldiers would carry them in their pockets to commit community. And today they're used around the world in various, uh, you know, the first responders, AA organizations where they build community. I had these handcrafted and painted and designed in the U.S. The front is the image of the show. The back is actually the uh, illustrated narrative of the hero's journey that we take why we're all connected by receiving it you commit to continuing this purpose you have uh, taking the action and really changing lives so I want to welcome you to the quiet warrior tribe we're now in 17 countries and there's less than 50 of these a year that uh, that go out so welcome aboard thank you so much you're thank welcome you. and this will be sent out to you and uh, I'm going to send you my book as well. I'm going to sign it for you because in it is my, it's a bit of a memoir, but it's my story. And I think that we've got more stories to tell. So on that note, let's give it to you to wrap up, Mark. Anything you want to say before you wrap? Anything where people can get a hold of you and your stuff? Uh, yeah, markjstrauss.com is the book site. And I'd be proud for people to get the book, talk about the book. Uh, it's an adult book. It's narrated by a 10 to 12 year old, but you'll see from the reviews on Amazon that adults have enjoyed it. And there's parts of it that are really funny. And uh, I'm just so touched that the reception has been so great. Well, that's fantastic. It is. It's, it's, it's lighthearted at times and it's very entertaining. So, hey, Mark, uh, one last question that came to my mind 
you don't have to answer it. I just have this dark sense of humor. I was thinking when you're talking about your mom and my my mom, my mom's weapon of choice was the Hot Wheel track and the wooden spoon. And those two little things, they, were, they hurt when I got it. I don't know if your mom had a weapon of choice or just her bare hands. Uh, the bare hands was worse because she was really powerful. <laughs> my, her, her oldest brother was a professional boxer. Oh, uh, gosh. Did well. My mother <laughs> trained him. Oh, but, boy. <laughs> oh, my God. But uh, unfortunately, her weapon of choice was a, a leather strap yeah. she kept in the closet. Uh, the There's one poem in the back. Uh, you, you got me going again. So, you know, I control the show, so I'm just going to keep you on a few more minutes. <laughs> there, there's a poem in the back there about uh, Grandma Katie. Uh, and that was, who is that again? My mother's mother. Uh, yeah. After my grandpa Max died, she'd come stay with us a few days every few months, and I got really close to her. Yeah, it's almost like a surrogate. Can you do me a big favor? Because I just want to capture you reading. Can you pull that out of your book and just read it to us? This would yeah, be like a sure, ma I... magic moment. When you're ready, I'll just full screen you for a few couple minutes. Everybody, just listen to this. Come back and listen. It's heartwarming. Uh, it's right at the end there. Which, what's the title of it? Yeah, it's uh, called Grandma Katie, page 266. Okay. Uh, Grandma Katie. The sky, a July coconut haze, the blue and white enamel sign, 49th Street and 14th Avenue, the two-family brick house, one in from the northeast corner, is a small religious school now, it's concrete stoop, four steps. I would have guessed six. It's painted over yellow too many times. And the chink in the balustrade to the left, against which I fell, is sanded smooth. My memory is frozen into still frames. In one, I hesitate at the top step on my new red tricycle. In another, a cold rag is wrapped around my wrist. A pea green cotton house dress with small white flowers, billows like a tent. Steam lifts off the clear suit, filling a broad maroon bowl, a thin stick of celery, two carrot chips, a chicken foot with puckered skin, and three, and three large, large toes. toes. <laughs> uh, this is this is the first ever on my show where we're having the poet read and, and the student is is reading along. That's just fantastic. Everybody in the book, uh, One-Legged Mongoose at the back, you'll see a collection of these poetry. And uh, and there it is. Mark's holding up. Hey, Mark, congratulations on all your success. We'll be keeping in touch. And thank you for being on the show. Tom, thank you so much. You're welcome. Everybody, find that true purpose like you see Mark has done. Take action and live the life that you desire and, and maybe help other people do the same. Go for it. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca